Today's guests are Mike Gagne and Craig Vinci of Alfinity. They're going to come here and talk to us about their products. Michael Gagne is an inventor and currently founder and CXO of Alfinity. He is a parallel entrepreneur with bioprocess and single-use technology sectors. With multiple products to his credit, he couples real-world application experience and out-of-the-box ideas to generate disruptive innovations. Craig Vinci is co-founder of Alfinity and uh, responsible for their Paracloud company also. We appreciate you stopping by. I know you're on a busy schedule and trying to catch up on things worldwide now with, yes, with the things that you're doing. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Alfinity and how this kind of got started? Because you've been involved with quite a few things, uh, both of you, through your careers. Yeah, so Alfinity is, has been kind of a passion project that we've had or I've had for a number of years. Um, we were very successful at implementing uh, some of the ideas that we had at a previous company called Artisan that was more focused on valves. I'd always thought there was a lot of opportunity for pumps and mixers, uh, ergo the term that we coined Pixer uh, for Alfinity. Uh, but you know, we, we just sold off that product line and that company and this was the next in the queue that we could develop. So we're super excited about it. Well, I have to say the Artisan products were quite impressive and they've done a lot of good things in the industry. I know you've shared with us some you know, major players are, have employed them and have really been things to help them with their productivity and adding value to their processes. A absolutely, no, it was stunning in terms of the growth. I, it was accelerated by COVID. I'm not sure you know, where these things are being utilized in their entirety, but it seemed like we were getting calls weekly from uh, General Perna, from the uh, task force there about deliveries, et cetera, et cetera. So we were certainly right in the thick of things, uh, trying to keep it going. Absolutely, and then I think also they were, they were part of the Smithsonian uh, demonstration, right? Well, no, that was, that was Aquasin, which Earlier, is another uh, another one of our product lines, uh, had, uh, it's kind of my personal uh, moment of, of excitement, my, my biggest one of my career, when one of my ideas got put in the Smithsonian, yeah, so that was our other company, Aquasin, that we had founded previously. Okay, excellent, excellent. So maybe you can uh, share with us the uh, a little bit about the Pixar and what that is. I think you even have a, a demo that you can just show us a brief little piece oh, of it. To, to all right, it. so that's a great point. It's not Pixar. That's a cartoon uh, firm, uh, Pixar. It's Pixar. It's a portmanteau, okay. which is a contraction between pump and mixer, Pixar. Uh, you may have seen some bat signals that we're sending out on LinkedIn. Uh, we're at the early days of it, and we're just starting to reveal some of the, the features that it has, but we're really excited about it. I think we have a sample somewhere. Yeah, I'm yeah. Great. So you, you have a demonstration here, so maybe you just give us a quick idea of how this works and so folks understand. Sure. Yeah, so we start with the definition of a pump, right? Typically is one input, one output. Mm -hmm. And there's some suction conditions that can happen if the input is too far away from the pump itself. We think this design overcomes a lot of those limitations. So in this design, you've got a main input here some outputs around the bottom ring, and then also additional inputs on the top. So for a pump where you're used to thinking of one input, one output, it's kind of a lot to look at all at once, at once. But what we've noticed is as we put this in front of people and they think about it, there's a lot of applications. That the, that and the hence the name, it's both up. a pump and a mixer. Absolutely correct. So, yeah. so then, then that's how we go. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. So here the, the diluent is just plain water. Yep. And that's in the tank up above. 
with them up here so it's running. You can see in the forward tank, one input, one outlet. And we've got clear water to the forward tank. Then the dye gets injected into the side. <clears throat> That's an additional input. It's getting mixed with the diluent coming out of the tank mm -hmm. on top. And you can see the, the lighter yellow, yellow yep. color coming towards the front. Now we'll do it with another color. You'll see that get diluted. And then yellow and blue make green. Yep, and very nice. And that gets, the, communicates the point, but it gets far more complicated. We can have multiple versions surrounding it. We're calling them Pixar Constellations. And shear rates and so on, you're obviously studying that. And well, in this case, shear's good because we're mixing, you know, uh, concentrate. We put it into a different application. Those things are very important, bioreactors, et cetera, and we intend to do that. Yeah. Very nice. Doing that testing. And then the other part of the company, I guess, is, you know, let's just talk about Paracloud and what you're doing there. Yeah, so w once we divested uh, Elf or Artisan, uh, too many A companies, um, we had two streams. One was this hardware piece, which is Alfinity, and then we had some ideas about the future of the control side of things. So we're really, at Paracloud, we're uh, working on processes and controlling them from the cloud, right? And then, you know, ultimately having AI capabilities to overlay on these much more modern data sets that we're going to be getting. Um, than what we might have seen in traditional PLCs. You're much better at explaining it than no, I would. That's good, and I would just say uh, we, we coined the term PROCAS, process controls as a service. And rather than taking the, the power of AI and trying to pile it on top of all this legacy stuff that's already there, this is really a ground up effort to take advantage of 21st century programming languages, architectures, and then apply. And you're able to do this within the things that we have in our industry for the regulatory things like Part 11 and other things with data integrity and things like that? We are. It's very early days. Those are obviously really key milestones that we've got to attend to, mm -hmm. but those are absolutely in the roadmap. You know, we've got three or four programmers working uh, right now on it. We've been working for the last six months kind of in concert with this. We're developing systems that can apply this that we control via the cloud be a pair of cloud. So and it will, if you want to add any more context to that, Craig. No, I think that's good. Okay. Yeah, I think Excellent. That's, I think that's good. So you've seen a lot um, with this industry, single use in general. What would be something that you would tell a young person coming into this industry now, maybe for a successful career or maybe to avoid some potential mistakes or something if you were talking to a young person? Um, really good question. You know, I'm I'm a little bit unorthodox, so my I, I'm, I'm always big on learning the history of why decisions were made 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, there's a lot of ideas that are are you know kind of considered dictum or just law that are potentially even accidental how they occurred, and so. I would sidle up to the old members of, of the team, the older members with the experience, who really may remember why you made a decision or didn't make a decision, um, you know, about a process or about a piece of equipment. Um, there's there's so much context and so much experience that's walked out the doors in the last ten or so years that the guys that came up with these things at companies like Genentech or Amgen aren't there, and you know, sometimes it was just a happy accident, you know. Oh, how did we come up with EPO? Well, the researcher was working super late one night. And <laughs> exactly. There you go. Yeah. Exactly. Craig, I don't know if you want to add. No, and, and one thing to add there, when a lot of those SOPs and processes were made, um, technology like this didn't exist. So oh, yeah. it, it's you know, it's one of those complex situations where you have to hold two thoughts in your head at one time, yep. which not everyone is great at, but yeah. there's a reason they do it the way they do now, and then take what you've learned and how can you apply new technology to the existing SOPs for well, a better outcome? And, and we talked briefly about this, but you know, you even see it inside the standards organizations and so on. I'll just share with you, Michael, you were a member uh, of the BPE for quite a long time, and you were there really at the early days when, when that started. And we're having discussions right now about simple things like the actual gauge with for a clamp on a traditional tri-clamp type fitting okay. and a lot and the BP does not have a requirement for the gasket dimensions it lets the seal kind of fill the space mm -hmm. and so those people that were in the room back at the formative days of BPE you know why that decision was exactly. made exactly uh, and I would say none of them are here now and I'm kind of one of the links 
to the generations across that to try to make sure we don't undo what they intended to have Abs happen. Absolutely, and I find myself in the same role. I'm not nearly as technical as you are, I, but I, that's one of the biggest frustrations that I see is like, oh my gosh, we're having the same conversation we had 20 years ago, and now i got to go beat my head against the same wall. So, yeah, w one of the things that we're super excited about to kind of bring it back to the, to the picture is to be able to articulate a vision of where we want to go with this. So this is a piece of hardware, maybe a, akin to an iPhone prior to an iPhone's release. You know, everybody's running around with Blackberries or, or Razors. They didn't understand that you could have an app store and you could have music downloads and, and, and. A little bit the same sort of thing with Tesla. You know, we, Tesla really had to show the market how to use their batteries and their motors yep. and the software. We're kind of in the same space. We've got two companies, one's a hardware and one's a software, that we think marry together beautifully to, I think, get, be the center of gravity of what we consider Pharma 4.0. Wow. Forward. Fantastic. So, in, in closing, what trends do you see? I mean, obviously, your products are going to make an impact like the past things that you've worked on, but what other general trends that you could see in either bioprocess industry or the single use that you would say right now that you see coming through? We're obviously in the middle of a pandemic. There's a lot of supply chain stresses. There are other things going on. But what do you see you know, in either the coming months or beyond? Uh, well, I hope we see an equilibration of, of demand or, or kind of a normalizing of demand so that you can reach it. I mean, we're hearing about companies that are up 900% in terms of year-over-year -year revenues. Uh, you're seeing lead times for things like tubing or hoses at 54 weeks. You can't get disposable aseptic connectors. So, you know, we've always, every time we make a product or invent something, it's because we can't get somebody to make it for us, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's a bag or this or that. So. My hope is that that happens so we can kind of catch up because it's been fast and furious. Craig, I'm sure you want to... Yeah, maybe one general trend too is um, cell and gene therapy, personalized medicine, right? Mm -hmm. We're reading a lot about the promise of some of those therapies. A lot of what we work on, Michael mentioned it in the beginning, enabling abundance in medicine. Uh, we're trying to get this thing down to some really low flow rates in a consistent way. We hear a lot that there are not any well-established uh, cell and gene therapy manufacturing Absolutely. systems or protocols right. yet. We really want to help enable those. And, and that's a trend we're going to see as we see more and more FDA approvals coming of gene therapy. It's such a manual process now. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, it's really, you know, like the postdoc in the lab doing most of the manipulations right now. And so we have to streamline that. We have to close the process. We have to do things. One of the visions that we've been sharing with people is, you know, think of like a 3D printer for this. It's going to be a tabletop device that will be in the CVS or the Walgreens and able to do a lot of that processing. And I think technology like this should be able to help that. Yeah. No, we're, our, our mission, as Craig just alluded to, is kind of hashtag abundance in medicine. If you want to follow us or any of the stuff we're doing, if you just go on the social media and you hit hashtag abundance in medicine, you'll at least be able to track some of what we're doing. It's a very personal story. You know, I sold one of the businesses that we had about 10 years ago. My chief technology officer had cancer. They had shut down a facility that was doing all the, the cytotoxic work and he couldn't get, well he got it, but there was about 50% of the doses uh, available of chemo drugs. Uh, as to what the market was, and he had to go to the emergency room to get the, the uh, uh, drugs, and then if he got them, somebody else didn't. So it was really, really impactful. That's what we did with Artisan. That's our massive transformative purpose, MTP. Um, and it, we find that it really galvanizes our team and people to try to you know, make that mission happen. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, um, I appreciate your time and stopping by to see us here at the Bioprocess Institute and wish you well with Pixar and, and your other venues going forward. And we look forward to for you stopping back to see us again. Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you so much for having us. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.